2017 is gearing up to be the year of a 3D platformer revival. We have Mario Odyssey slated for a holiday release, fingers crossed A Hat in Time will finally make its debut, and of course the first one to show up and bring nostalgia back from an almost 20 year absence is Ukulele. With the same dev team that made Banjo-Kazooie coming back for another round, I had high hopes for this game. It seemed like all the right jiggies were in place for another masterpiece. But did it deliver? Well, to get a fuller picture, we need to take a look at what made Banjo so endearing back in 1998. Let's talk about it. If I could sum up all the greatness of Banjo-Kazooie into one word, it would be charm. The bear and bird were polar opposites of each other, Banjo being the happy-go-lucky protagonist, while Kazooie was snarky, pessimistic, and full of rude quips. Gruntilda was such an unforgettable villain as she always spoke in rhyme, and reminded you of her looming presence every step of the way. But even the minor characters all had distinct personalities shown prominently by their unique speech patterns. From a burping hippo captain to a kind of racist snake charmer, the levels themselves were expansive yet simple at the same time. While there were a lot of diverse areas to explore, everything was placed for a specific reason. Distinctive landmarks made navigation and memorizing the level layouts very simple. It sort of felt like a theme park where you could get on all the different rides that each location had to offer, like climbing the giant snowman in Freeze Easy Peak, or clearing Jinxie's nostrils in Gobi's Valley. And the crazy thing is, they knew that all these locales and characters were memorable because they test you on them at the end of the game in Grunty's Furnace is fun. More on that later. But what has always stuck out to me most about Banjo is the secrets. If you collect all the notes and jiggies, it unlocks double health to give you extra help in the final boss fight, and the way it handled cheat codes was particularly clever. If you found the secluded spellbook Cheeto, he would give you a code to double your feather and egg storage, but you entered them on the sandcastle floor of Treasure Trove Cove that was used for another jiggy earlier on. Reusing assets for multiple purposes? Smart! But of course the cherry on the mystery cake was the secret eggs and ice key used for stop and swap. Long story short, these were extremely hidden collectibles that would unlock special abilities and rewards in the sequel Banjo-Tooie, if you had save data for both games. It was so ahead of its time that it wasn't even possible on the N64, but now on Xbox Live, this vision is fully realized. Rareware had big plans for these games, even from their inception, and the way it teased you with something you just couldn't reach was so genius. It planted natural craving and curiosity in your brain, and delivered in an out-of-the-box way no one else was doing at the time. Speaking of Banjo-Tooie, while it stumbles in a lot of ways as a second installment, a lot of cool aspects are in place here. Particularly how the different worlds are all connected and you can travel between them through shortcuts or train stations. I had no idea that when I retrieved stolen treasure from a sleeping caveman, I was actually leaving the first world and entering the fifth. And then when I came back to the same area through Pterodactyl Land, I was like, oh, no way! Interconnectivity is the name of the game. In Banjo-Kazooie, you could complete every stage stage in one go, except for one instance where you need a power up from a different level, but in Tui, Jiggies are interwoven all over the place, and many different abilities from various worlds are needed to collect them. This was the kind of stuff I was so excited for in Ukulele. After such a long hiatus, I could only expect that the X-Guys from Rare had more crazy ideas to put into practice with their first IP as Platonic games. And without a doubt, a lot of the appeal that made Banjo great has made its way into Yuka. The humor is still on point, the characters are silly and unique. I stand by saying that Capital B is one of the most creative ideas for a villain in the history of video games. It's a triple entendre. You see, cause he is a B, he's a businessman, and so he wants capital, and he's capital B like the big bad boss. On top of that, you have hilarious ideas like a literal trouser snake and an old school dinosaur named Rextro. It's just perfect. Not to mention the cameos from other indie games and the heartstrings of nostalgia being pulled straight out of your chest and thrown on the floor. But while the basic premise is virtually the same, quirky animal duo collects items to unlock worlds and go on a wild adventure, some things are improved for a nice touch. Like the Ghost Riders, which are Yuka's version of Jinjos. You don't just collect them in this game, you have to complete some sort of task for them to be accessible. Like using your sonar sense to cause invisible spirits to appear, feeding hungry ones some food, or 
or even fighting them. Probably the best thing that ukulele does is the expanding the world system. If you collect enough pages, you can either unlock new areas or enlarge old ones. So if you're enjoying one level a lot, you can just grow it to experience more instead of moving on. The stage that does this best is Tribal Stack Tropics. It's pretty big to begin with, but when you expand it, it becomes gigantic with so much more to do. However, as you progress further, it costs more pages to broaden worlds. So they need to have more pages hidden behind these expansions to make them worth it. So by the time you reach the fifth world, if you don't alter it, there's only like three islands and just a couple pages you can collect. Also, there's only five levels in the whole game, by the way. They're big, but I would have rather seen 10 smaller worlds, but hey, to each their own. To get the best experience with the expansion system, I recommend spending an hour or so in the smaller versions of the level first, to get the hang of everything and become familiar with major landmarks. This way, you appreciate the changes that happen, rather than seeing a giant world from the start that might seem overwhelming at first. At least, I think this is how they intended it to be done anyway. Unfortunately, this is about where the good qualities end. The negatives of ukulele highly outweigh the positives, and its biggest crime of all is a lack of polish, which is very apparent within the first few hours of playing the game. There are a bunch of little problems that could have easily been fixed with a few simple changes or a little more time and development to work out the kinks. Like how the camera faces Yuka and Laylee when you enter a room, instead of behind them toward the open area, which can cause you to fall off cliff sides if you're not careful. On top of this, camera perspectives will change when you enter trigger points, which can make platforming near impossible in some spots. It's bizarre when it happens, it feels like a game made in 2017 should not have these problems. Some cutscenes and text boxes aren't skippable, but others are, which is really confusing. It'd be one thing if you couldn't speed them up at all, but because you can part of the time, it becomes really jarring when you reach some dialogue that can't be skipped. It's inconsistent and annoying because the base speed of the text is really slow. But to be fair, they have recently patched this in an update, showing that indeed it was a simple little adjustment that probably should have been included from the get-go. I'm surprised no one is really talking about this, but there's only six types of enemies in the entire game. Basic henchmen, big strong spiky dudes, robot sentries, underwater jellyfish, military bees, and eyeballs that attach to nearby objects. That's it, which is very underwhelming when compared to the Banjo games, where each area has unique and varied foes related to the level's theme. The main corplets do change aesthetically in each stage, but their mechanics are exactly the same. Combat in general feels like an afterthought in this game, and baddies are haphazardly placed without much forethought. There aren't any checkpoints or warp pads in ukulele, so when you die, you respawn at the last doorway you walked through, which could easily be on the other side of the map, and you have to make the slow trek back to where you were. One time, I fell off a really high platform all the way to the ground, and the only way to get back up there is to start the arduous climb once again. In fact, I wish that I had just died instead because it would have respawned me closer to where I fell. This is frustrating and time-wasting to say the least, especially when its predecessor in the year 2000 had a better better system. Quills are ukulele's version of notes, but they again seem placed at random and without any particular direction. In Banjo-Kazooie, the notes were either along the main path you would take to explore the map, or guiding you towards secrets or hidden collectibles, but in Yuka, the quills are sometimes just as hidden as the pages, and don't really guide you in any significant way, they're more decoration than anything. But on top of all this, there are significant design decisions that seem to be direct downgrades from Banjo titles. Instead of gathering items like feathers or eggs to use your abilities, Ukulele has an energy bar that depletes as you use it. While you can collect upgrades to increase its size, the bar recharges very slowly and awkwardly, like why? So basically, rather than having limited ammunition that you can stock up on, your new resource is time. And when you run out, you just have to wait. And we all know how fun that is. Let's talk about Dr. Quack's Quiz Time, Yuka's incorporation of a trivia minigame. Grunty's Furnace Fun was a hilarious surprise the first time you see it, because in place of a final boss battle, you're greeted with an over-the-top, ridiculously wacky game show. It's the final exam before the ending, testing you on all the different things you've experienced, and you get to choose what types of questions you're asked based on the tiles of the board. These include deciphering a specific map by only a screenshot, knowing whose voice matches which character, or even questions about Grunty's personal life that you find out by speaking to her sister, Bruntilda. You can try your luck at Joker spaces to get skips if you don't want to do a particular tile, and you have to watch out for death squares that launch you into the lava pit below if you get the answer wrong. Now, here's Ukulele's quiz show. 
On top of trying to bank on nostalgia, it's just inferior in every way. One straight line, 10 random questions, three strikes you're dead. Even worse, this happens three times throughout the game instead of once at the end. The first of which occurs after visiting just one world. So rather than testing your vast knowledge of all the crazy things you've experienced, it asks you questions like, how many quills have you collected so far? You know, something every player would know off the top of their head. It becomes a terrible nuisance really quickly. So instead of saying, oh boy, this might be a challenge, you say, oh come on, not this again. It's frankly ridiculous that this is in the final game in this state. Even the transformations felt uninspired. In each world, these different forms you turn into are used for one or two pages at best, and that's about it. In Banjo, it felt like they were much more vital to your quest, letting you reach new areas you couldn't as the barren bird, or pushing you to think outside the box. Like in Mad Monster Mansion, I was stumped for weeks on how to get this jiggy that was just out of my reach, but it blew my mind when I figured out you could go on the rooftop via the maze, opening up a whole new world of possibilities as the pumpkin. You could even take these transformations outside of the levels to find hidden secrets secrets in Grunty's lair, like the aforementioned Cheeto books or raising the water level to progress in the game, not to mention that they were super cute too. In Yuka, you get this snowplow that's terrible to control, but they expect you to do precise platforming with, so there's that. Nah, some of them I did enjoy, like the school of piranha fish that can fit in tight spaces, or the pirate ship equipped with different types of cannons to blow up rocks, but overall they felt constricted, shoehorned, and like a missed opportunity. Some of the abilities were really confusing too. There's one called Sonar Splosion, and I thought the description was cheekily telling me it breaks glass, so when I saw a cracked window, I tried it out, but to no avail. Twice, I found what seemed to be an obvious connection to this ability, but nope, turns out there's another move called Reptile Rush that's specifically used to break through glass panes. Instead, Sonar Splosion is used to pop balloons or destroy crowds of enemies. I guess they really weren't kidding when they said don't use near glass. But why mention it at all then? The moves are fitting in relation to what a chameleon and bat would have, but I think they could have done better at explaining what they do in practice. Like how turning invisible also redirects a laser beam beam if you stand under it, or how Yuka's tongue can extend to ridiculous lengths if he's reaching for a lizard lash contraption, even though his tongue is only this long normally. Wait, does Yuka have two tongues? Rextro and Kartos crack me up because their whole shtick is that they're outdated gaming conventions that nobody wants to play anymore, so they poke fun at modern tropes like pay to win systems or microtransactions, but then their actual gameplay is just as bad as it has been in the past. Rextro's arcade games are glitchy, drawn out Mario Party minigame rejects that are not fun in the slightest, and Kartos complains about how minecart challenges aren't popular anymore, but his levels are annoying and cumbersome to control. I have to assume that this is the joke. Otherwise, it's a downright travesty. But ironically, what has disappointed me most about ukulele is what it should have done the best. It's incorporation of secrets, or lack thereof, I should say. There's a ton of instances where I think something special might be hidden, but then it turned out to be underwhelming, especially in the overworld of Hyvory Towers. For example, I found this library book puzzle where I thought it might be some sort of code system to input cheats, but no, it was a simple little brain teaser to unlock a pagey. There's this giant menacing machine that sucks up all the pages of the world, and it has extensive security and a giant button at the entrance. Oh man, this must be a crazy secret. Maybe it unlocks when you collect all the pages in the game. Nope, you just have to knock over these huge books to press the button and you get a pagey. You know how I said everything in Banjo was there for a purpose? Yuka has all sorts of areas that seem to be important but end up being meaningless. Simple fluff to make the world seem bigger. Like this giant pit of acid. Seriously, no idea why this is here. It's not on your total screen, but there is one extremely hidden type of collectible in every world called pirate treasure, and there seems to be a cloud of mystery around it when you find them. What could they be used for? Guess what? It does nothing. It literally just unlocks achievements. Good job for finding them, you! But worst of all is that Platonic tried to build suspense with secrets ever since the toy box demo they released to early backers. If you collect all the quills in the toy box, it unlocks a hidden room. And when you find it, this robot tells you about a secret clue in the real game that you can reveal by ground pounding a specific island next to a pirate ship. When I found this before the game released, I was so excited to discover what this could possibly be. So I scoured the game trying to track down the island, and when I finally did in the last world, sure enough, a little robot comes out of the sky to give you your reward. When you talk to him, he says, Loading exposition, 50.1%. Please be patient. And that's it. 
You've got to be kidding me. Now, I can only assume this means that these hidden clues will play a role in their next game, and triggering the dialogue here will unlock something new in their next adventure, but it doesn't explain any of that, and in the moment, it was such a huge letdown to have all this buildup of a big reveal, only to find this in its place. I can't begin to describe my disappointment with the lack of secret stuff in Yuka, especially knowing the minds behind the game. This should have been the one area that they excelled at, but instead, it feels about as bare bones as it gets. And that's probably the greatest problem with ukulele. Like I said, its biggest disservice is lacking polish. It feels like a tech demo, playable but unfinished. So many of Yuka's problems could have been fixed if they simply gave it another six months to a year in development to work out all the problems and add more meat to sink our teeth into. People are calling ukulele the spiritual successor to Rare's golden franchise, the Banjo 3E we've been waiting for. But in this current state, it's more like Banjo Kazooie 0.5. HD. All that being said, I still enjoyed the game. It was a fun little experience for what it was, and they rely on the nostalgia pretty hard, so if you're a fan of Rare's previous platformers, I'm sure you'll find charm here as well. But I know that the developer's potential is much greater than this. It feels like they wanted to rush this game out to meet a deadline, and the gameplay suffered extensively for it. Now, I can only hope that Ukulele was a warm-up, and a sequel or a new title by Platonic will have some real thought put into it. Until then, we have games like A Hat in Time, just around the corner. While it doesn't have a release date yet, they have promised that it will be in 2017, and this game has been in development for almost five years, most of which has been putting finishing touches and adding polish to the final product. The beauty of the 3D platformers of yesteryear came from all the little details and things below the surface. You can make a game that has all the right elements, but without the care and charisma, it won't be remembered. So here's to looking to the future. No doubt the audience has a desire for this type of game, and there are many more on the way. Even titles like Snake Pass, while more of a puzzler, still embody that level of nostalgia and magic, while also trying something totally new from a gameplay perspective. So I hope to see even more innovation and new things in the genre and games to come. Tell me your thoughts on ukulele. Obviously, I've talked long enough about it. Do you think it was up to snuff? Or are there areas you wish it had improved as well? Tell me in the comments below and let's talk about it. All of this critique comes out of a place of love for this genre, and I can't wait to see what happens next. So thanks for watching, I'll see you guys next time, and stay frosty, my friends. Hey guys, today's episode was sponsored by Dollar Shave Club, and they have a great opportunity for you that can help support this channel. If you go to dollarshaveclub.com slash snowmangaming, you can select from a wide variety of razors for just one dollar, and they'll deliver them directly to you. Going to the store is a thing of the past, and not only is it super easy, but they're great quality razors as well. There's no hidden fees or anything, you can cancel any time, so if you enjoy my content and want to get a great deal in the process, check out dollarshaveclub.com slash snowmangaming, and it would help out a great time. Shave time, shave money. Thanks guys, I'll see you later.